stuff to go over this morning. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're trying to delve down into what transpired on Saturday and what that means for us, what the effect is going to be with the changes to the cashable tax credits and uh, and where do we go from here and so much more. Uh, to zero in on this is uh, Brad Keithley, uh, who joins us now to discuss it. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Michael. How are you? You know what? I am. Uh, I'm doing just fine. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm ready. I'm ready for a whole new day. I'm just, you know, <laughs> trying. I'm trying to figure out exactly where we're at on this whole on this whole deal. So, uh, where are we? Uh, where are we at? Where are we going? So let's divide this conversation on oil tax credits into two pieces. Uh, what the Senate did, or what the legislature did Saturday really affects oil and gas tax credits going forward, cashable oil and gas tax credits going forward. Mm-hmm. And then after and then after we do that, let's talk about going backward, what, what, where we are with the accumulated past credits that uh, aren't affected by the legislation. Right. Going forward, uh, what the legislature did uh, Saturday night late was agree to terminate um, cashable oil and gas tax credits going forward. So that means – after uh, July 1, they made it retroactive to July 1. After July 1, the state no longer will be obligated to pay cash out to uh, people who are uh, small producers who are trying to develop uh, new projects that don't yet have production. The state will convert to what is the usual form for dealing with uh, oil and gas producers um, in, in these situations, which is to allow them a credit for their costs, a deduction for their costs uh, after the, the production starts. So essentially, once production starts and they start incurring uh, oil and gas production taxes, the the new legislation will allow them to deduct those costs. Right, which is uh, a standard, no, which is a standard business is. practice for almost any business. Right, you can deduct costs of doing business once you've actually started producing a profit. You have to pay tax. That's when you get your refund or kind of your rebate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly right, and that's and that's the that's the system we've gone to. So we've terminated tax credits, in in the cashable tax credits, and in the process, the Senate did a few, or the legislature did a few other things. I keep saying the Senate because it was the Senate's bill they were dealing with, but the legislature did a few other things. They um, uh, hardened the floor uh, on on uh, uh, on production taxes, that means that you can't – that the producers will now uh, be obligated for a minimum tax uh, uh, even if their costs uh, go below a certain level. Uh, and that is uh, – that's a positive. That's something that, frankly, a working group uh, task force a couple of years ago had recommended, uh, and I'd looked uh, for uh, the legislature to adopt following that. It took them a couple of years to get to it, but they've done that. Uh, they've ring-fenced. Uh, 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 production taxes, which means that you can only deduct costs in the field in which they're incurred. So, for example, if uh, uh, if you if, if you have a major producer who's producing in a major field, um, and then they have some small production in another field, but that but that other field is a very high cost field, and and they're they're using up all their deductions in that other field, they can't carry those costs from the other field back over to the back over to the bigger field. So costs stay within within each field. Uh, and that's frankly a good thing. It's not it's not universal in the industry, but it's not uncommon in the industry. So right. that's an, that's another way of limiting, frankly, limiting down the deduction. And then the third thing that they did in response to uh, proposals the House had made uh, is they, uh, they included a provision that expires the deductions over time. If, for example, uh, a producer doesn't um, start production within 10 years of the time that he incurs the cost. The deductions, even though he ultimately may get to production, the deductions uh, are no longer applicable. He starts losing them. And, and in fact, they start losing them on a graduated basis, even if they have production uh, after seven years. And that that's something the House had included. So um, the Senate included that as part of the as part of the compromise, which doesn't seem like that's an unreasonable position. I mean, quite honestly, I mean, if you haven't done anything in ten years, I mean, I don't think you should necessarily be able to hold on to that. I mean, you can't carry on your, you know, business deductions, you know, unless you're amortizing something, you know, over a portion of years. But I mean, a ten-year limit didn't seem unreasonable when I read it. 
I, I don't I don't think producers will view that as as problematic. I don't, I don't think there's going to be any loss of investment um, uh, over that provision. So um, it, 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 it you could argue you could debate the, the the merits of it, but I just don't I don't think it hurts uh, our investment profile all that much. So yeah. uh, and and it seemed to be able it seemed to be something the house wanted to get the house on board so right and agreed to it right um so here we sit uh now we've eliminated the cashable tax credits and you went into just some details on several of your posts that talk specifically about okay great we've done away with it moving forward but we still have this big thing holding out uh you know over the top of it so i want to talk about you know what do we do about what we currently owe but also i want to talk a little bit about kara moriarty's reaction to this and aoga's press release which basically said alaska's not living up to their side of the bargain which is fundamentally untrue yeah it uh i think aoga got a little carried away in the press release they issued saturday night they were upset by some of the provisions in the compromise um and and they they issued a press release that was a little um uh, uh, tough on the industry or tough on the on the legislature, and I think they got a little carried away in it. So we have somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred and eighty million dollars, uh, seven hundred million dollars to round it. Uh, in in accrued credits, these are these are cashable credits that had accrued before July one, um, or are estimated to accrue before July one of this year. The legislature is not yet, or that, that have not yet been cashed out. That is, the the state's not yet cashed them out. What the AOGA press release said was the state has, has failed to continue to, or continued to fail to, to pay the credits as they become, as they've been accrued, and and yes, those credits have 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 been accrued, but the statute that governs the payment of those credits provides that the state is only is obligated only to pay a portion of those credits each year. Um, the way the statute was written. Uh, during low oil prices, there's a, uh, an only a given percent of the production tax revenue the state receives that they're obligated to put into the oil and gas fund that's used to pay off those credits. This year, it's about the fiscal year 2018, it's going to be about $70 million, $75 million, uh, somewhere in that range. Um, and so the $600 million or the $700 million that's outstanding uh, that $75 million in, in what the state's obligated to put in the fund would pay down $75 million of that. The statute clearly contemplates that the rest of it uh, rides over to future years. What AOGA uh, seemed to be implying was that somehow the state was on the hook uh, and had failed to pay that whole $700 million and was, and was breaching its obligation or failing its obligation to come current uh, when, it, when it failed to do that. That's not right. The statute's since the late 2000s or 2007, I think, when, uh, when, when we started this program or really got this program rolling, the statutes clearly provided that the states only got a, an obligation, a certain amount of obligation each year uh, to pay off, uh, calculated as a percent of production tax revenues. And, and the states complied with that every year. Some years it's paid a little bit more. During high revenues, uh, we put more into the fund and, frankly, advance paid. Uh, some of the oil and gas, uh, uh, some of those credits uh, that the state that the state owed, but in low oil prices, the state has cut back to what the statutory requirement is. They've not put additional amounts in there, uh, and that's what the statute clearly provides. So, for AOGA or others to argue that the state is on the hook to pay more uh, than that than that annual provision required by the statute uh, is is just wrong. Uh, that amount, the seven, the seven hundred million dollars that's that's accumulated, that will have accumulated through July one of this year, uh, in past cashable credits, will be paid out according to the statute, or should be paid out uh, according to the statute. And this year is seventy-five million, maybe next year is eighty million, maybe it's sixty million, but that's how the statute will pay it out. And at some point, it will all be paid out uh, in accordance with the statute. But to claim that it has to all be paid out at once or paid out when, when, uh, when the producers incur the costs that are then subject to the credits, it's just wrong. Right. Um, and, that's, and, and that's – I think we're going to see that issue uh, continue. I think when we talked a little bit in, about the capital budget, I think we're going to see that issue roll into the capital budget also and be controversial there. Well, and that, that kind of would let, led me right in my next question, because I think that is part of the case. Uh, there's already been some discussion. The Senate attempted to 
um, I guess, forward fund some of these things or, or pay in to pay more than uh, uh, than what was, uh, you know, statutorily required to do so. Uh, they wanted to spend something like two hundred eighty eight million dollars on that. Uh, and I know you've written in your in your piece here on uh, on Alaska's for a sustainable budget that you have a fear or a concern, I guess, that it's going to be that that amount could be rolled into some line in the capital budget and still be part of the equation. Yeah, the Senate, the Senate has tried to has tried to put additional money in. Now, this is money not owed under the statute, not owed to the oil and gas credit fund under the statute. But the Senate tried to roll some additional money in. Frankly, what they did is they took the remaining amount in the, in the statutory budget reserve, one of our savings accounts, just sort of wiped that account out, and in their proposed capital budget, put it into the capital budget to be contributed to the fund and to pay down that roughly $700 million in accumulated credits with that $288 million, pay it down right now. As I said, uh, under the statute, the state's only oblig- obligated to put about $70 million uh, into that fund. Uh, and at the time the operating budget, at the time the Senate proposed to do that, the operating budget provided for that $70 million. So that $288 million that the Senate was proposing was extra uh, uh, beyond the statute, just sort of a, 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 an advance payment that was going to go uh, to producers. In a time when we're cutting the PFD uh, and in a time when the state is, is, is on uh, shaky ground uh, fiscally, uh, taking money out of reserve, taking money out of savings to pay, advance pay bills, particularly by that amount. I mean, that's four times the amount or five times the amount, when you count in the amount that was in the operating budget, five times the amount that we owed this year. Taking that money out to, to advance pay on these credits, uh, I think, is the, is the wrong thing to do. We ought to pay it out in accordance with the statute. I don't I, – the, the, as, as the parties talk about the capital budget, uh, and given AOGA's press release, I suspect there are some who are trying to continue to push for taking the 288 or some amount uh, and put it into the capital budget as an advance pay. Um, I, I, I just think that's I, I just think that's wrong. And to and to personalize it, I went back last yesterday in response to a reader's question. I went back and calculated how much per Alaskan um, uh, that 288 million advance paying that 288 million sort of translates to. And it's roughly, if you translate it into the number of Alaskans who, who qualify to receive the PFD, that's roughly $400 per Alaskan that the Senate's proposing to advance pay. Um, you know, for a family of four, that's $1,800 that the Senate's proposing to take out of savings and advance pay to the producers at the same time uh, as the Senate has proposed and the legislature has, uh, in the operating budget, cut the PFD back to back to 50%. If you if you look at that another way, if that if that uh, 288 million dollars was was put into the PFD instead of being used to advance pay producers, right, was put into the PFD, that would increase the PFD from about $1,100 to over $1,500 and would increase the amount of the statutory PFD that's being paid from 50% of the statutory PFD, the amount that the legislature has cut it back to, to 70%, that we get 70% of the PFD. So we're talking about a fairly hefty uh, amount with a, with a significant potential impact on individual Alaskans that the Senate's been proposing to advance pay producers. I don't think they ought to do it, but we may see that issue come up uh, as the capital budget negotiations continue. So in the long and the short of it, uh, we're kind of uh, coming down to the end of this segment, but in the long and the short of it, when it was all said and done on Saturday night at midnight, uh, was the compromise situation with the uh, cashable tax credits and the changes to the deductions and everything else, was this a good or a bad thing for the citizens of the state of Alaska as a whole in your in your mind? I, I think going forward, what, the, what they did on Saturday night was a good thing. Uh, I think it... it, it, it transform the Alaska program, which had been, uh, I think, excessive. We were giving excessive benefits uh, to producers. It transformed it into a more common uh, a common uh, oil and gas program, uh, common throughout the world. Uh, and I think it did it in a way that still maintains Alaska's uh, attractiveness as an investment opportunity. Uh, I think people will still come here for the rocks, for the opportunity that we have and I think the fiscal terms that that uh, that they came to in the compromise are good. 
uh, and will continue to be uh, attractive uh, for investors. And I think it's good for Alaskans that we've cut out that additional program of giving cash uh, out of the state's uh, out of the state's coffers uh, directly to producers without any oil and gas production uh, to exchange for it. So I, I think it's a positive. I think they came to a positive solution. But we're not finished with those credits yet. Until we get until you know the 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 air becomes clear about what's going to happen with the ones that have accumulated to this point. Uh, I'm not sure Alaskans are out of the woods. We're going to need to watch the capital budget to see where it goes from there. I thought it was interesting. Tammy Wilson yesterday um, made kind of an assertion. Uh, she really didn't follow up on it when I kind of pressed her on it was uh, that she kind of intimated that, oh, no, we really, those cashable tax credits kind of needed to continue. That was kind of, I, she wouldn't answer, didn't answer. We went on to kind of a different subject um, about, but that was, I think, one of the reasons why she voted no is because she thinks that that is contributing to the increase in production. Do you want to comment on that quickly before we run the clock out? Well, when you give, when you give people money, <laughs> when, you, when you subsidize things, you will, you will get more activity. So, yes, right. there was more activity. But were we getting bang for the buck? Were we getting a return on the money that we were paying out investing in these projects? I don't think so. And if you look at the numbers going back, I don't think you can say we were. So, I, I, yeah, it may have attracted more activity in the sense we were subsidizing activity. But I think those dollars are better spent on Alaskans rather than subsidizing that additional exploration. All right. Brad Keithley is our guest. we got more coming up. Don't uh, don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show, AM 700 KBYR. Uh, Brad Keithley comes in every week to sit down and talk with us about a variety of subjects, usually revolving around oil, uh, gas, politics, and the budget. He uh, he joins us this morning again for our second segment. We went over in the first part exactly uh, what happened on Saturday, what the ramifications of that were. That leaves us with one big thing left on the uh, on the table, and that, of course, is the uh, uh, and that, of course, is the uh, uh, capital budget. And uh, there are some concerns about some of the things that could happen there. Uh, Brad, what are you uh, what are you concerned about when it's all said and done? Well, the capital budget is sort of is sort of the stealth um, uh, spending uh, level. I, the Senate made a big deal uh, at the time they passed the operating budget of saying, "Oh, we." Held the budget to $4.1 billion. Aren't we good? That's near the long-term sustainable level that that I and others have talked about. And so we we really complied with that. But that's not that's that's only part of the picture. The 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 sustain long-term sustainable budget level uh, is is a combination of the operating budget and the capital budget combined. So you can't claim victory uh, based upon what you only what you've done in the operating budget. You can only analyze how the legislature's done in that regard once you add in the capital budget. They didn't get the capital budget done by July 1, um, and, and now they're working on it. Uh, and uh, whatever amount they come to is going to need to be added to the operating budget, the amount for the operating budget, to assess uh, the overall spend that the legislature come, came to this session. I've got a couple of concerns about, about what's going on in the capital budget. One is the amount. Uh, if the if if 4.1 is the number that they want to claim that they held spending to, they better not spend a whole lot more on the capital budget. Uh, if they spend 200 million dollars, that that takes the 4.1 to 4.3. So the the number in the capital budget needs to be small in order to keep that spending number down and keep it near the long term sustainable budget level, so they can they can legitimately claim the victory that they did uh, off the operating budget. So the capital budget needs to, needs to stay small. Uh, and it needs to avoid. They need to avoid doing things like we were just talking about. They need to avoid using it to advance pay. Um, and by advance pay, I mean pay in, in advance of what the statute requires. Pay in, in, in advance of the statutory uh, payment uh, scheme. Uh, advance pay uh, uh, an additional amount to the producers. We need to keep uh, our payment schedule to what the statute provides, and not drain savings to, to pay out. Uh, additional amounts to producers. So that's another thing in the capital budget. Are they going to try to slip things in there uh, that not only will increase overall spending, but are are less than efficient uses uh, of um, of the state's uh, 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 savings dollars? And then there's a third thing about the capital budget, and 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 people tend to ignore this or tend to overlook it, uh, but that is what are we doing to the overall economy? 
uh, with the capital budget. Now, there are those who, who, who go around saying, look, we need a capital budget because we've got a construction industry. We need to keep fish, uh, 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 feeding the construction industry, so we need a capital budget to be able to have additional construction and keep the construction industry, industry going. But frankly, that's a fairly inefficient use of state dollars. In the ICER uh, analysis, Institute of Social and Economic Research, economic analysis that they did last year that was published in March of 2016, ICER looked at various categories of, of spending and how they affected the overall economy. When you look at the capital budget, ICER's conclusion uh, was that uh, for every dollar that goes out the state treasury uh, to a capital budget, only 65 cents of that uh, generates income in Alaska. The remainder of it almost immediately, well, immediately goes outside to buy steel and other specialty products that are used in the construction process and doesn't help the Alaska economy at all. It doesn't generate income in the Alaska economy. So we're, asked, we're actually losing money from the Alaska economy when you pay that dollar out. We only get 65 cents back in income. The PFD, on the other hand, uh, it generates $1.40 uh, in income. By the time a PFD dollar that's in an Alaskan's hand stops knocking around uh, the economy, uh, we've generated $1.40 of income uh, in, 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 the in the Alaska economy. Um, and so when you look at the, at the effect on the economy of those two categories of spending, the capital budget only generates 65 cents of income. The PFD generates $1.40 income, especially when you're in a recession, which is largely defined by lack of money in the economy. You want to be, be putting your money where you have the biggest bang for the buck, where you generate the most income. Um, and if, if we see the capital budget – uh, growing to more than just a minimal amount, uh, what we're going to see is we're hurting the Alaska economy. We're taking dollars that otherwise clearly could be distributed as PFD dollars and generate the dollar forty in addition in, in income uh, that that Alaska could very much use during this time of recession. We're going to see we're going to we're going to see rather than that if we have excessive uh, high capital spending, we're going to see you know giving dollars out a big chunk of which is going to head head right out of state. Right. So I have concerns about, about you know, the size of the capital budget, what that's going to do to overall spending, about what we're going to spend it on. Are we going to spend it efficiently, and are we going to stay within the, 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 the statutory constraints that we've got uh, on some of these spending categories? And then what are we doing to the overall economy uh, with this capital budget? You know, are, we, are we trying to help one industry, the construction industry, at the expense of the overall economy? Uh, and if we see a if we see a high capital budget, that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, so two things. Uh, last thing first, uh, because what you just said resonates so hard right now with me. Last week we were talking about it. I asked you the question, why? Why is the legislature doing what they're doing? And you laid out very clearly that you thought it was an attempt by the legislature to, uh, you know, kind of capriciously pick winners and losers. In this case, they wanted to protect, uh, you know, state employees. They wanted to protect the university. They wanted to protect tech government agencies from the effects of the recession uh, by doing by performing actions that would, in fact, lengthen and worsen the recession, which just seems so counterintuitive to me. It blows my mind. But this this could be, as you say, just another case of that in this regard. But in this case, propping up the industry, which would be the construction industry. So that's my first point, and I'll let you respond to that here in a second. The second part of that same point is I've never understood the argument that government creates jobs when it does all this capital spending because these guys go to work. Uh, I mean, aside from the fact that you that you just pointed out that a lot of this money goes out of state anyway, so it never hits the, the direct state economy outside of the employment factor, these are all temporary jobs. Government is not creating any of these jobs. You know, if you gave money to uh, an entrepreneur, to a business— the business could invest, it could expand, it could hire more permanent employees, it could do so much more with that money and turn that money so many more times, you know, over the course of years instead of over a single four-month project that it, it's just mind-blowing to me that somebody actually uses that as an argument. I'll let you address those two things. Well, I mean, that, so, so what they're essentially saying when they make that argument is we value construction jobs. Uh, and, and income in that part, sector of the economy more than the economy overall. Because when you're, when you're going to spend money in the construction sector, 
you're going to generate, yes, you're going to generate jobs, and yes, you're going to generate some income in that sector, but you're hurting the economy overall. You're spending money in a sector where we generate less income, less money circulating in the economy, in the Alaska economy, um, uh, than we would if we distributed the money as, uh, as the statute requires, as the PFD statute requires, um, as PFD. So your, 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 your statement at the beginning is exactly right. We're picking winners and losers. The legislature is saying we're going to favor we're going to favor the construction industry and our construction contractors, some of whom are donors, uh, and and construction <laughs> workers, um, uh, some of whom are are members of unions that 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 have representatives uh, in the legislature. We're going to favor that segment of the economy over the overall economy. We're going to take money out of the hands of individual Alaskans um, that who spend it. In a manner that generates, on average, one point dollar or one point dollar forty cents for every dollar put into the economy. That way, we're going to take it out of the hands of individual Alaskans, and we're going to give it to this subset of the Alaska economy, recognizing because they know this now, given the ICER study, recognizing that a large chunk of that's immediately going to go out of state. But this little subset, this little construction contractor, uh, construction employee subset, is going to get the benefit of that, and we're going to choose that over the over the broader economy. That's that, when you're in a recession. I mean, that, that's sort of bad anytime, right? right? That's sort of that's sort of bad to choose winners and losers anytime. But when you're in a recession, and the cause of the recession is a lack of income in the economy, lack of money circulating in the economy, it's especially bad. You're saying these guys, we're going to insulate these guys from the effects of the recession, even though the the knock-on effect is individual Alaskans suffer more. We have higher poverty levels. Uh, we have we have lower retail sales. The retail sector su- uh, suffers. The 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 uh, uh, restaurant sector and other sectors, retail sectors, uh, suffer. Uh, we're we're just going to favor these guys to protect these guys, and that's uh, that's just bad policy. So that's what I'm going to be looking for in the capital budget to see how much of that is creeping in um, to the to the capital budget. There's a certain amount of capital budget that's required in order to get federal matching funds, federal highway matching funds. And that's something in the neighborhood of $120 million to get all of the federal highway matching funds we're entitled to. That's probably a good use of money because it generates, you know, nine times or 10 times an additional amount uh, in the overall economy from federal funds. But beyond that, when, when we're not getting, you know, huge federal matching funds for, for these state expenditures, if we're just putting it in the economy to build buildings or to, you know, do deferred maintenance or other things that are just capital items, uh, we're, we're going down the wrong road from the standpoint of the overall economy, from the standpoint of making our recession softer on both uh, the overall economy and on individual Alaska families. Down to the last three minutes, Brad. So Brad Keithley is king for a day. I've given you the magical wand. You can now tell <laughs> folks in the legislature what they need to do as the capital budget is placed before their their conference committee here. What are your wishes and recommendations for the conference committee as we move forward? Uh, absolute minimal uh, capital budget uh, built around that $120 million uh, that uh, is necessary to get fed, uh, matching federal highway funds. Um, not, not much more than that. I mean, a million here, a million there, okay. But if we start talking about tens of millions, 10 million uh, or tens of millions uh, more than that, uh, I think that's I think that's the wrong direction to do. And if I were the governor, uh, I would veto it because I, we need to we need to consider the overall Alaska economy first. And we need to consider Alaska families overall uh, first before any given segment of it. And, and just trying to prop it up, prop up one segment, be it the construction trade, the oil and gas trade, whatever, trying to prop up one section of it by additional capital funds, to me, it's just the wrong way to go. So bottom line it for me, where, what, should the, uh, what should the capital budget be at roughly, uh, if this is the case, what should the capital budget be at roughly when it's all said and done? 120 to $130 million. Uh, the numbers I've seen uh, in terms of what's necessary for the, highway, uh, uh, the matching highway funds Unrestricted general funds, UGF, about 120 to $130 million. That's where it ought to be. 
much more than that, and I think we're going down the wrong road. Okay, final question. We're down to the last minute. Tammy mentioned yesterday she's hearing rumblings that the House may pass the capital budget but only approve the capital budget if the full PFD amount is reinstated. What say you? Good thing to do. That would be a very positive step uh, on the House part because it would it would comply with the PFD statute, bring dollars back into the economy that genera- generate a $1.40 uh, in income for Alaskans, uh, and and put us better position us to deal with the recession, both the overall economy and Alaskan families than uh, than where we are now. And politically smart going into an election season when the entire house is up for re-election. <laughs> All right, I, I think so too. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend, for coming in and joining us. Good to talk with you, Michael. Thanks for having me. It is your home for Common Sense Radio. Back with more, Hour 3, Dead Ahead, right here.